a farmer from not too far from here, actually, <laughs> Lily Lake Organic Farm. Uh, so we can talk a little more about uh, the details of soil fertility management, cover crops, uh, and competition. So, uh, Dave, you can take it away and get that clicker up there. <coughs> Okay, good morning. Uh, my wife and I farm about, uh, I've got a little bit of a cold, so bear with me. We farm about 27 miles due south of here, uh, certified organic grains and hay. Prior to that, we had an organic dairy about 20 miles south of here, and then after that, another organic dairy about 30 miles north of here in Wisconsin, so very familiar with this area. I'll be covering actually three different topics here. I've got about 30 minutes, so I'll be uh, going through kind of quickly. I like to hold off on questions to the very end. And uh, if you need more information, I've got a lot of text in my first half of the presentation, so bear with me with that. A lot of good information. After that, we'll get into more pictures and more practical information. The fertility management. I found some quotes here I really liked, especially that second one. Over fertilized plants may be beautiful, but otherwise useless, like people whose energies are devoted so completely to their appearance that there is no other development. I think we see that a lot in today's society with the media and that. We have to remember, too, there's more to it than NP and K. The non organic system really touts that. But we need to look at other minerals, we need to look at trace minerals as well, too. And of course, the bottom fold there, my favorite fertility of the soil is the future of civilization by Sir Albert Howard. Okay, soil sampling. Do any of you uh, sample yourselves anymore? Okay, a few. All right, uh, just a few points there. Uh, you want to test in about the six inch range. I like to test in the fall time. Whenever you test, it's best to do it about the same time every year. If you test maybe three or four years later, like we do, you want to test in the fall and <coughs> the next time as well, too. Uh, also want to point out uh, the bottom there, if you've got uh, areas like wet holes, you've got some gravel knolls, I'll keep that out of the sample because it's going to uh, vary the test quite a bit. And so I would not sample those uh, with my sample in that field. Unless I have a large area, then I would probably sample it separately. My soil test results here, this was taken uh, actually in no late November of 2012. I'll be testing again probably this coming fall. We have it tested through Midwest Labs. Uh, we really like uh, their results, what they do here. And I'll be talking a little more in detail about some of these points here. I do want to highlight uh, potassium here. If you've got livestock, be very careful if you've got potassium levels in that 4 or 5% range. You tend to have health problems with high potassium levels. A lot of farmers who have farmed conventionally, uh, they went with a maintenance program. They tend to have high potash levels. You need to watch that. Organic matter, these heavy rains are becoming more commonplace, we all know. If your organic matter levels are in that one and a half, two percent range, which is quite common, you're not going to be able to uh, have much uh, success there with keeping your soil in one place. If you increase that organic matter level, you can really soak up a nice big rain. The calcium, I'm running about 73 to 74 percent on the average. When I came onto this farm back in 88, my calcium levels, base saturation, were probably in the 55% range. It takes time. Uh, what we tend to do is if we have pH levels above 6.5, we use gypsum. Gypsum comes from a mine out near Des Moines, Iowa. It's not really too bad uh, price-wise. High calcium lime is used anything under 6.5 pH. I called yesterday, the price is $12 a ton plus trucking. That is located near Pontiac, Illinois, which is two hours south of here. I would suggest uh, if you're changing over and are low on calcium, you start with calcium first. It's, it's very reasonable. Try to limit your application to about one ton per acre. 
Magnesium, you may never get it down to that 12 to 15 percent range. Um, it just takes time. We're running about probably 16 to 18 percent. Excessive magnesium, tight soils, ties up potassium. We don't want to see that. Phosphorus, again, uh, I doubt that you're going to have levels that high. We tend to focus more on the P2, the reserve potassium in our, in our soil test. As far as sources, Tennessee Brown Rock, we use Idaho Rock Phosphate. Make sure you use a soft rock phosphate. A hard rock is going to take forever uh, to really break down. You probably have seen the charts in the textbooks about the three-legged stool, the three components, the physical, chemical, and biological components. Of course, the chemical is a real simple soil test. Physical, we can do a lot with the tile. I would say in the last probably, what, two decades or so now, there's been a lot of emphasis <coughs> on equipment that will uh, help with aeration, drainage, and so forth. There's been a lot of improvement in the industry in equipment that will help the physical components. But what about the biological? Other than organic farmers, it never really was given much attention to until what, maybe five, ten years ago or so. And so that is something that is really coming on strong. It needs to. That's so important. And we can do a lot with cover crops with the biology of the soil. For those of you who use manure, try to put it on the fall time. If you go into springtime, you're going to have issues, especially with organics. You're going to have, uh, it's going to be highly soluble. You're going to have more weeds more issues, try to put on in the fall time, try to work in if you can, and try to put on not too uh, heavy of amounts. Okay, techniques to help conserve nutrients. You want to see the ground cover as much as possible. And also the bottom one there, <coughs> sound straw. I know at times, especially starting up, you're going to need the income, you might need to sell straw. If it is that way, so be it but try as much as you can to keep the straw on the farm. Okay, now we're going to be talking about crop rotations. Okay, I want to highlight NOP. And what does NOP mean? <coughs> National, National Organic Program. Okay, National Organic Program. Okay, for those, are any of you at this point now at the point where you're really seriously thinking about certifying organic in the next year or two? Okay, quite a few, okay. The NOP, National Organic Program, the definition of a crop rotation. It's the practice of alternating the annual crops grown on a specific field in a plant rotation or sequence in successive crop years so that the crops of the same species or family are not grown repeatedly without interruption in the same field. It's got the long definition, but that's what it is. That'll be in your standards. There's a couple of standards I want to point out here that you need to follow closely. Okay, you must manage crop nutrients and soil fertility <coughs> through rotations, cover crops, and the application of plant and animal material. <coughs> okay, also, uh, you must implement a crop rotation, including but not limited to sod cover crops, green manure crops that provide the following functions that are applicable to the operation. <coughs> okay, we hear about uh, crop rotations and that, are they really beneficial in that? We tend to think they probably are, but research has shown that many benefits accrue as the rotation becomes longer. We tend to have less problems with weeds, disease, insects, and so forth. Diverse crop rotation is one of the most powerful tools that a farmer has for controlling weeds and maintaining fertility. Okay, the key to a good rotation is to have a diversity of crops, crops that are from different plant groups, are seeded at different times and have different nutrient demands. Here's a story here. I worked with John Simmons a little bit uh, when we were involved in the New Ag Network. John is from the state of Michigan. Okay, they have up to 11 crops in their system. And I mean 11 crops, I'm talking both cast crops and cover crops. He's probably got about a, probably close to 50, 50 mix of each. Now, if you're starting to convert over, ideally, and of course, not too many people can do this, but if you have the finances, I would say those first couple of years, do as much cover crop uh, building as you can. 
you're going to try to raise corn and beans with the prices right now of conventional crops, you're not going to get much income. You're going to get behind the eight ball, so to speak. You need to work on changing some things in that soil that has been abused for who knows how many decades. You start out, if you don't have the finances, what we did was we raised hay, alfalfa, grass, hay for a number of years, and then little by little we started taking hay out of production and going to corn and beans and, and wheat and oats. I've worked with a few farmers, mentoring some farmers who have started out raising soybeans the first year. Let's say they had corn the year before, they went to soybeans, and actually they've had, most of them have had pretty good luck. Uh, you want to plant your beans later, you're going to have more weeds. Yes, you might lose a few bushels, but you're not going to lose a crop to weeds. As far as I mentioned before, stay away from corn if at all possible. You're going to have a lot of expenses. Uh, it's going to take a lot of inputs, and you're going to end up with $3 a bushel, and who knows how many bushel of corn you might get. Probably not, not too good that first year. <clears throat> you want to maximize soil coverage in your rotation. As I said before, keep the ground covered as much as possible. Okay, what I have here, this is a three-year rotation. This is very <coughs> common for organic farmers. And in this rotation, we're noticing that first year we've got winter wheat that was planted the fall before. We're going to seed it down to red clover cover crop. And so we've got something on that ground for every day of the year. Okay, year two, we've got that red clover cover crop. We're going to plow it under. We're going to have a couple of weeks there, maybe three weeks, it'll be bare ground, but then we're going to put it into corn. If the corn is harvested, we can still have time to put rye in. We'll have a week or two of bare ground, but then it'll be a rye cover crop growing throughout the whole winter. Okay, year three is very summer. We're just going to plow into the rye, put in soybeans, and from soybeans to winter wheat. So if you were to add that up, there's going to be approximately 33, maybe 34 months out of 36, you've got a crop on the ground, cover. <coughs> okay, cover crop practices. Have any of you ever been uh, on that website? Mm -hmm. The Midwest Cover Crops Council, okay. They actually have a meeting, February 24th, I believe it is. Um, is it right here yet? Okay. Yes. The, Organic Farming Conference is the 25th through the 27th. And uh, this is up in Madison. I think it's on campus, I believe. So parking could be an issue, but I've got some information here if you're interested in going. It's, I was part of this council until I only ran out of money. Um, budget cuts and that, but it's a really good working group. Uh, mostly educators, researchers from the land grants uh, in the upper Midwest. And uh, that's a really great site to go on to. What they have is something called a cover crop <coughs> decision maker tool. Have any of you ever gone to that uh, site? Okay, okay, a few of you, great. What you can do with this, it'll select the best cover crop choices for what you want to do, and even narrows down to your own specific county, which, which is really good specific. Here's an example here. What they want to do here, as an example, is to plant uh, nitrogen fixed and cover crop before planting corn. So this is in western Wisconsin. Estimated planting dates, uh, harvest dates, not an issue at all with drainage in the field. What they want to do here is they want a good nitrogen source, soil builder, and they want to intercede with the cash crop. So you go into this tool, just a matter of clicking a few buttons on your computer, and you'll notice that red clover scores the highest. There's other options there too, but that's just a great tool to use. If you're going to plant a cover crop, all of a sudden you get to thinking, gosh, you know, there's a lot of things I want to do here. Make it simple. Try to narrow down your reasons to maybe one or two primary <coughs> reasons. Otherwise, you're going to get overwhelmed. You're not going to want to do it. It just works that way. Okay, before you plant this crop, you want to talk to hopefully some other organic farmers nearby. If not, talk to others who have been successful at raising cover crops. Uh, decide what you really want for benefits in that cover crop. You may want to start small. I would not uh, do a large acreage unless you really feel confident about what you're doing. 
let's say you have a crop and all of a sudden you're transitioning over and you've got a crop failure. So what are you going to do? Let's say you've got a crop of soybeans. The weeds get away on you. You're going to wait till the soybeans are ready to harvest and harvest nothing but weeds? I hope not. At that point, what you can do is, is chop off the, the weeds, plant a cover crop. It's an excellent time to, to do that. Can we talk about the economics? We got the cost of the cover crop seed. Uh, termination. That's a huge point there. If you raise something like oats, they're probably going to winter kill. <clears throat> if you got something like rye, that's a whole other story. You get a wet spring. Has anyone here ever had trouble with rye getting away on you? Okay. That can, okay. That can happen pretty easily. It's happening to me too. You've got the value of the nitrogen from the fertilizer in the cover crop. I've listed here some of the cover crops we've grown on our farm. Okay, the ones on the right, only a time or two, and I want to highlight here hairy bench. Okay, hairy bench is great. You've got livestock. If you're not selling into the organic markets, you can use herbicides. But we're talking about organics today. I would not recommend raising hairy vetch if you're going to sell uh, small grains into the organic market. The reason being is the hairy vetch matures a couple of weeks before your oats or wheat or barley will. You're going to have that little black BB and that uh, truckload of small grains, you'll probably get it rejected. So as much as hairy vetch is, is great for, for nitrogen credits, I would stay away from hairy vetch. If you're grazing and that, whole other story. It might be okay. But we've used a lot of oats, rye, and buckwheat, and oil seed radish. We use sorghum Sudan grass for cabinet thistle control when we need it. Okay, so you need to determine where to put that cover crop. Figure out your rotation. Where does it fit in your rotation? Remember, you're going to be raising small grains if you're certified organic. So you're probably going to have a time frame there late summer and you can raise a lot of cover crops and look for windows of opportunity where you can plant that cover crop. Okay, I didn't quite get this one on the slide, but you'll notice, you can barely make out some of the crops here. You'll notice, in the, of course, in the springtime, there's lots of opportunities. And then again, late summer after your small grain comes off, and even later in the fall, there's lots of opportunities there for cover crops. And I want to point out this book. Managing cover crops profitably. I think I may have saw this book maybe on the table over there. It's a Sarah publication. There's also a free download. This is the best book I've seen on, on cover crops. <clears throat> is that where that illustration comes from? Yes. Yep. Who's the publisher of that book? Sarah's mm -hmm. Sustainable Ag Research Education at USDA. Okay. Yeah. And it can be downloaded for free. Correct. Yeah. In fact, I think it's got another slide coming up that will have that download on there. It's great. Okay, so you're looking at the timeline chart we just looked at. A lot of questions you need to ask. How are you going to kill that cover crop? If you're going to plant the cover crop, you need to have some time for it to grow, right? Otherwise, why spend the money on the seed, utilities, and so forth if it's going to have a short duration of time to grow? Will it winter kill? Do you want it to winter kill? You may or may not. How are you going to seed the cover crop? With a drill or with a seeder? Like a broadcast seeder. What about the weather? You know how it turns dry in August. You want a chance of planting that cover crop and wasting that seed? How about your equipment? Do you have the time to do it? Now let's say that cover crops goes awry, <coughs> like we've talked about before with rye. The rye gets, you know, you're going to plow it when it's this tall. All of a sudden we get two weeks of rain. It's like this. Somehow we got to get that ride turned under. Do you have the equipment to do that? How will it compete with your primary crop? Cover crops, we've got grass cover crops. Uh, the ones that are pretty common we use are cereal rye and oats. Oops, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay, oats. I really like oats. Very inexpensive. They'll winter kill. And our, these kind of soils, we have very similar to here. We have a lot of clay loam in our soils. And I have found out that I try to stay off my soils as much as possible in the springtime, especially early spring. 
And so I try not to do any more tillage than I have to in the month of April, even early May. It's great for, for capturing nitrogen. What I have here is oats at a bushel per acre. This is seeded with the seed alfalfa and the Timothy grass here. I like this because it gives a good cover over winter. It just protects that new seed a little better. And so a bushel of oats with that uh, alfalfa grass mix just works great. Okay, rye is another great cover crop. It's great for suppressing weeds. Again, you've got the option of planting it after corn harvest. But I do want to mention some of the cautions. Okay, it'll, it'll tie mature rye, rye that gets up around waist high or so, is going to tie up nitrogen. If you're going to plant corn, I would not do it if your rye gets away on you because you're going to just tie up too much nitrogen for your corn crop. Remember, you're following the grass with the grass. Rye and corn are both grasses. It works better before planting soybeans. Okay, what I have here, this was taken, this picture, uh, the last day of the year, about five years ago. What I do is I chop stalks, I disc, and then I'll broadcast the rye and then disc it once more. And that's what we have. In this picture here, this was seeded down in November of 2013. Remember, this is over a year ago, how cold it was. It never had germinated whatsoever. There was just nothing out there. And this, I started plowing, and that's what it what ended up being. So don't give up on rye. Rye is very winter hurt. <coughs> I did some test strips here. This is sorghum Sudan grass. This is in a vegetative state. We used to actually work dairy cows. We used to graze our cows in that stuff. And it's about this tall. The first couple of days, you, you couldn't see the cows. You just you kind of waving through the Sudan grass. It's always kind of comical the last first couple of days out there. But I like to use sorghum Sudan grass for can of thistle control. Here's a picture of some roots. You've got your lateral roots down here. When you're going to till that field when the thistle is coming on, you're not going to probably touch those lateral roots. You're going to destroy these, but guess what? A few weeks later, the thistle is going to come back. And so tillage is, it may set it back, but it's probably not going to do a whole lot for it. This is Sudan grass. Uh, this is in October. And you can see what I like about this is that it really does two things. What I call it is a smother and starve approach. If you got that much Sudan grass there, it's, it's going to certainly uh, do, do some major work on the photosynthesis. You cannot get sunshine into that field there except on the outside edges of the field. And so the <coughs> thistles are going to be starved because there's just no photosynthesis taking place there. Also, with that kind of root mass, you're going to be taking up a lot of moisture. So there you've got the thistles down in here, they're somewhere, but they're just going to die out. Or else they're going to be severely set back for a couple of years, and they should not be much of a problem by doing that. Okay, this project was actually a, a project, it was a Sarah project. Um, there was about 15 people in Illinois that I had worked with on this, along with John and Dan. It was very successful, but I would caution the timing of your planting the Sudan grass. We planted ours about the 11th of June, I believe it was. We let it get up pretty tall. We clipped it and let it grow back. When I clipped it, I used my hay bind. I spread it out so I didn't choke it out cover the ground. I want to keep the sunshine, sunlight, out of that field. If you want to look into that, it's probably best. I don't think Dan is no longer working in the Ag Department. I'm not sure about John's health, but this is the Sarah grant. You can actually go on the Sarah website and, and locate that grant. LNC07-282. Okay, buckwheat is neither legume, grass, or brassica, but it's a fast-growing crop. It's great for nutrient recycling <coughs> and also extracting phosphorus. It's also known for the allelopathic effect that is stunting weeds. But the caution, buckwheat itself can become 
a real weak problem. It's very frost sensitive. It's a short season crop. What I like about it is that it'll really provide a really quick uh, ground cover. What I have here, this is back in 2005. We had done a research project with Michigan State on different uh, crops. We had cow peas, we had buckwheat, uh, we had um, a fallow strip, and one other crop, I forget what that was, but just to see what worked the best. The next year, I planted buckwheat. This is an old backup timeline that I've got. This is what buckwheat looks like. This is about the first couple of days in November. And I did this because this field I thought needed some help. I wasn't happy with the tilth of the soil. And even though buckwheat doesn't pay as well, I think I had 1,400 pounds per acre. And so I think I probably about mm -hmm. broke even. Mm -hmm. But given what I was facing in this field, I thought that was something that was a, a good thing to try. And I'm glad I did it. This is the following year. OK, yes, there is some volunteer buckwheat there. But as far as yield reduction, it's probably very, very minimal, if, if any. And you're going to have to trust me on this. The year before, that soil looked a whole lot different than it looked this year. We had better soil <coughs> tilt. The soil even turned darker. And so I was really happy with what it did. But again, I caution buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat itself is a weed, and you're probably going to have it around for a couple of years after you raise it for a, a cash crop. Dave, we've had real good success claiming buckwheat. Okay. Yeah, it okay. Like, it doesn't like it at all. Yeah, okay, okay. That was, Randy had a comment about flaming buckwheat. Yeah, if you got a flamer, uh, buckwheat is very sensitive to heat, very sensitive. Uh, you get down about, what, 28, 29 degrees, it's going to toast it. So yeah, buckwheat flaming would, would be great. We roll, we roll our carpet at that stage before it goes to seed and just crimp it down in the ground and then it goes to biomass and then follow it up and dry it behind it with a soil conditioner it works real well. Okay, another great idea. Great, yeah, excellent. Okay, this is actually a cover crop of buckwheat. And I want to point out when you plant buckwheat for a cast crop around here at this latitude, you're looking at planting it typically around the third week of July, give or take a week or so. You need some time before you get that first frost uh, to mature. <coughs> Determine the seed set, so you're gonna, you know, it may not all mature, but uh, that's a pretty good time around here to plant it. If you're gonna use it for a cover crop, I will hold off until about the middle of August. Again, you don't know when the frost is gonna happen, but uh, you do wanna get in before it gets too late, but if you put it in that late, you're probably not gonna get much volunteer uh, buckwheat the next year. Okay, brassy cover crops, like David talked about, if you're grazing, probably be looking at forage radish, turnips, maybe kale. We've used a lot of oilseed radish over the years. Tillage radish tends to get just, uh, roots go a little deeper, and it works great on the, on the subsoil compaction. <coughs> Oilseed radish, I've been happy with those. I've, I've raised them a few different times. If you're going to drill them, about 10 pounds by themselves. In a mix, two to five pounds. And uh, it, it, really, it really does good. I mean, it'll, it'll winter kill. Uh, in the springtime, you aren't going to notice much residue out there. It goes down deep into the subsoil. There's very few crops out there that'll work that deep in the subsoil. Okay, this is my cedar. I use this for crops like oats and rye. It, uh, it goes really quick. It's pretty handy, my three-point cedar. Okay, this is a mix that I've been pretty happy with, oilseed radish, buckwheat, and oats. What I like about these is that you've got the oilseed radish to work on the subsoil. You've got the buckwheat to condition the topsoil. You've got the oats that are going to stay green and be in the, in the ground until late winter, early spring. And so I like, I like that mix. Everything's going to winter kill. I want it to deal with anything in the springtime. And that's, again, the mix there mixed together. For expensive <coughs> cover crop seeds, let's say oilseed radish, for instance, I use my drain drill on, on that just because I want to get better seed placement, so I cut down the amount of seed that I'm going to use. 
Okay, this is the mix again of the oilseed radish, the buckwheat, and the oats. And this is the same mix about, probably about the first few days of October. We, obviously, we hadn't had a frost yet. The frost is going to toast that right now. Uh, but uh, it does grow quickly. Okay, legume cover crops, we hear a lot about legume crops for capturing uh, nitrogen for our corn crop or wheat crop. This is a picture taken up at Kellogg Biological Station up in Michigan. If you get a chance to go up there, it would just be a great uh, tour. They do a lot of things with organics. I'm assuming what this is here is this is probably sometime in early March. You know, we get those snow drifts throughout the winter. February is a little bit too early to frost seed. I think what probably happened here is the snow melted. It froze up again. They had a nice a little snow, which worked out well for them because you can see his tire tracks here. The snow will help carry the clover seed into the ground once the ground thaws. And so that's what's nice about frost seed. It's just an ideal time that red clover seed is small, it's round, and it's fairly heavy. And it'll germinate very easily in those conditions. <clears throat> this is red clover that was seeded in late April. The wheat was about five inches tall. I was getting a little nervous, but I was able to get it on without doing any damage to the wheat. And this is just a close-up look at the red clover once the wheat's been harvested. What I like to do with my red clover after small grains is about a week or two after harvest, I'll come in there and I'll clip it with my hay bind. I'll spread it out again. The sooner I clip it, the sooner it's going to start to grow. And so what I want to do is maximize as much growth as I can. And you can see this here in, in late September. <coughs> And there's a lot of growth there. What I have here on the left was a situation that I don't do too often, but I had alfalfa uh, cast crop for one year. And people say to me, my neighbors, uh, non-organic neighbors, they say, well, you know, why do you keep your hay in for maybe a year or two or three? You know, because they're having trouble keeping their alfalfa from dying out. Well, when you take a look at the organic corn prices. Right now we sold some food grade beet or food grade corn here in the last month. Average price was around twelve sixty a bushel. Feed grade is probably going to be around ten or so, I'm guessing. And so with that kind of price and those kind of yields, we can raise crops like alfalfa now for a year or two. And then here this was oats with a red clover cover crop. You can see the combine tracks. I'll come in I think a couple of days after this was harvested, and I'll clip that about four or five inches off the ground, and I'll get that clover coming right back again. Okay, what I want to show here is, is not the cultivator. I'm not, my topic is not on cultivation. But I want to show you, <coughs> see it here, the soil. Okay, this is what I normally would cultivate the second time through. This is 2013, very, very wet. There are a few weeds here, not quite as many over here, but the corn's getting to the point where it needs to be cultivated for the second time. This is only the first time through. Okay, what I want to show here is, if you see this soil, you can kind of tell it has that chocolate cake texture to it, that crumbly texture to it, which, which you find in the fence roll. Okay, how, that, how does that happen? It wasn't that way when we came there in 88. Fertility, and especially cover crop. With that soil like that, even though it's, it's wetter than what it looks like, you notice how that dirt is rolling in around the base of that corn plant and covering up very well. I did cultivate that once more. I probably wouldn't have had to. But when you get that kind of flocculation in the soil, it just is amazing what it can do for you, especially with cultivation. Okay, this reminds me of a story I know of a guy in Indiana. I don't think he's here today. I guess I can pick on him. He talks about his ragweed problem. Every year I see him, God, I got this ragweed problem. I got to do something about it. I think he still plants crops every year in that field. A little different situation here. Hopefully you've only got a few acres like this, but let's say you've got a wet hole or an area that is always weedy or always got problems with the soil. What you might want to do is focus on the cover crops 
raised cover crops for a couple of years, try to make a change in that soil, whether it's tight or whether it's weedy, to somehow get to the point where you can finally raise a crop. <coughs> Okay, I'm just about done. Um, okay, just some things you might want to look at uh, with your cover crops after you've raised them. Here again is the uh, download that I think Harry had mentioned, free download. Actually, if you want to look at a copy of that, there's a copy on the table back here. So we get that first. I've got a book too. Okay, okay. I like to leave with this last thought here, especially if you're farming not organically and you want to switch over to organics, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Any questions? <coughs>